it is such a pleasure to meet all of you this afternoon. Uh, so when Vandana uh, said to me that Priya, there's this beautiful NGO uh, called Vidya and they're helping children not only get educated, but acquire knowledge and experiences of different types and from different people. I was very, very happy to hear that. And I was very happy to hear that I was doing this kind of work. And I said, listen, how can I be of help? And she said, why not? Let me talk to the management and we will call you there. So today, to come here in front of you is the result of that action. I was a very good mountain climber. I was a very good trekker, right? And I was very tough and strong and very, you know, slim and trim and very fit and healthy and what have you. And I was the best mountain climber in my college. People in the college would, you know, always say, when are you planning the next trek? Let's go to Chinchwati. Let's go to Mathiran. Let's go to Takmak. So all the different hills in Maharashtra we had already done. And then there came a time when there was also an opportunity to do rock climbing. And this rock climbing was such a fascinating experience because in rock climbing, you use not only your hands, but you use ropes to climb the hill or the mountain, right? And learning all of those tricks, those rope tying and that whole carabiner and the raffling and the whole jumping and, you know, leaping and catching was so fascinating as an experience. And I was very good. And my instructors, uh, they were very, very proud of me. But when I started, you know, enjoying the trekking so much, I started meeting more trekkers and we joined something called as a climbers club. I loved being with all these climbers and trekkers and listening to them and being friends with all of them. And then one day, one of the senior trekkers, he said to me, listen, we're going on a trek to Everest Base Camp. And we're going to be five of us. We're getting a sponsorship. And Priya, we would like you to come along uh, as one of the trekkers. And as you can imagine, Everest Base Camp is like a fascinating dream. Everest is such a huge mountain, right? It's several thousand feet above the sea level. Now you might wonder that why did I want to do Everest Base Camp? It's because everybody was wanting to go for it from that climbers club. But out of all those people, the senior trekkers chose me. So I was selected to go for the Everest Base Camp. And I said to my parents, you know, guess what? I'm going to Everest Base Camp and I've been selected and I'm so excited that I'm going. And like, you know, out of all of the people, they chose me. And, you know, I'm like, I'm going to go. I'm like so, so, so excited. I was so jumping with joy when I came home. I had been always encouraged to go for the, all the treks and the camps and things like that. My parents never had a problem. So I very conveniently assumed that this also would be just fine and there wouldn't be a problem. My father said, no Priya, how can you go? And I was like, what? What do you mean I can't go? So he said, yeah, because how are you going to go? It's so far away. And there are these four men who are going to go along with you. We don't know them, how safe it might be. It's not right. We can't let you go like this. And they said, it's a very high mountain, even though it's not actually Everest. It is still very high and we're worried. We can't let you go. It's going to be difficult. No, you can't go. I was so upset. I cried. I didn't need food. I didn't want to talk to them for the next two days. I was making such a fuss about it. After that, I even stopped trekking. I was so upset that the one camp that I really, really wanted to go and I was so excited for, I didn't get the permission. I felt uh, sort of cheated. I felt really bad. I didn't understand my parents at that time. I was too young. That chapter closed there. And Everest Base Camp was an unfulfilled teenage dream. That but then I realized with time, as I became a mother and I held my baby for the first time, my parents, I know they said no to me for some things and especially Everest Base Camp, but there was maybe some truth in that. There was love in that. There was a feeling of worry and concern that they didn't want me alone out there in the hills with somebody. And now fast forward to 2017. A very old friend of mine called Rio Krupi. Rio is a friend from one of the companies, the American companies I was working with. So he's Italian, but he lives in Australia. 
uh, with his family, his beautiful wife and three daughters. Now, Rio came to me uh, to meet me in 2017 uh, over dinner with his daughter, Keisha. And Keisha and he, while they were talking, they were telling me that they had visited Nepal recently and uh, they saw the, you know, the vision of Everest from a distance and they were so fascinated. And he said, my God, I'm someday, I hope I can climb that mountain. And as you can imagine, Mary to waha pe ganti baj gai. I was so excited just to hear the name of it, that Everest Base Camp is coming back into my life once again. And I said to him, you have one supporter. I will come with you. My father said, you know, this is ridiculous that you're taking this decision. My daughter, my son, my sisters, my parents, all my friends, all of these people suddenly said, what's wrong with you? You can't go. You're now too old. You've got, you're too fat. You know, you're not fit anymore. This is no need for doing this. There is why do you have to prove anything to anybody? Nobody needs to see this glory. What in the hell? You focus on the other stuff that you have to do. Why should you go? We are worried about you. So I said, yeah, yeah, we'll see, we'll see. And I sort of, you know, shut out the chatter. When you say shut out the chatter, that means there's a time in life when you stop listening to others and you take decisions for yourself. Because you're so sure of the decision. You're so sure of what you want to do. I was no more the young one who just had to listen. I was a 53 year old woman who was capable of taking a decision on my own and taking an informed decision, understanding what all it will take to get on that trek. Because the Everest base camp is not a small height to climb. It is 5,600 meters above sea level. It is right up on the Kumbu Glacier at the foot of Everest. And it is, takes about 12 to 13 days, depending on your fit fitness, to climb the mountain. So that means you're climbing for about 12 to 13 days. So it's a lot of effort. It's not something that, you know, uh, is easy to do. I actually started studying, understanding what the practice would be like, what efforts would be required, what kind of training I would have to do, what kind of gear and equipment and clothing I would need, what kind of, for example, uh, travel uh, you know, arrangements I would have to make. That means how much money I would have to spend, et cetera. So all of this was something that took me some time to put together. But finally, when I had all that information with me, I told Rio, confirmed to him rather, that I will go with him on the camp. So I consider him like an older brother and he's very, 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 very lovely person. And September, 2018, we were to travel to Nepal for the trek. So around say August or September of 2017, I started the preparation. It meant walking every day. It meant regularly doing all kinds of fitness exercises. Also watching the kind of diet I was eating. And it also meant that mentally preparing for the task at hand. And when the time came, about a month before, I sent my family my tickets. All the worries started once again. What is going to happen? No, 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 no. Kaise jaogi? Kaise hoga? Kahan rahogi? Ye, wo, dunya bar ke sawal shuru ho gaye. So many questions. So much worry. And I said, all right, the worry is fine and all that, but don't worry, I'm all set, I'm prepared, I've got my gear, I've got my training behind me, I'm going to do just fine. Rio had convinced another three of his family and friends to come along with him. So imagine this, I was supposed to go with four men when I was 18 years old to Everest Space Camp. And look at how destiny comes back to play at you once again. At 53, I was again going on Everest Space Camp with four men, right? And under normal circumstances, one would think that this is such an odd combination that I'm going with these people who I don't even know that well. But for me, the focus was very singular. I wanted to do Everest Space Camp because it was on my bucket list. The one thing that I did before I left, I of course thanked God for the opportunity, but I also did one important thing. I was writing a book for the past four years, for the past three years, sorry, at that time. 
and i wrote that and i sent that entire file of my work that i had done jitna bhi maine likha tha tab tak that story was the story of my father's life the book is called jangi and i sent it to my sisters to my son and my daughter and i said to them god forbid if something happens to me on ever space camp i want you to publish this book for me so i was super excited as you can imagine and on the 14th of september i left my home my family came to drop me off at the airport lots of tears lots of hugs and kisses and i said goodbye to everyone and i flew off to nepal so now starts the second leg of my story which is now i am at nepal all right as i reach nepal i get greeted by my guide who's going to be my guide for the trek and by the time i got into the hotel it was really you know a uh, past midnight so i didn't get to meet rio and the other four boy other three boys and i just quickly had a dinner it was a beautiful lovely thali of food that they were they had arranged for me and i had the dinner and i went off to sleep the next morning early i was supposed to rise by 5 o'clock i was supposed to pack all my baggage into a special bag that they had provided us this kind of a bag it's called like a duffel bag it's like a stretchable and you know a nice long plastic bag the reason they have those bags is because it rains very frequently in ever space camp on the trek and so therefore to avoid our clothes and all getting wet they put the all the clothes in the bag and this bag is then carried by the sherpas by the time i slept it was about 2:30 in the night that night after having dinner packed my stuff and i was so excited so nervous my stomach was all churning at 5:30 in the morning i was ready and uh, my doorbell rang and there was my friend rio standing he says hey priya i'm so excited yeah we all screamed and jumped and we were so excited about meeting each other i met the other guys they were also so excited and happy and we all set off finally we went straight to the kathmandu airport from there we were supposed to take a flight to lukla now the flight to lukla is taken in not a large proper big airplane it's taken in a very small airplane because the actual lukla landing strip is very tiny and you can't have a big plane you know that comes and you on the runway etc this particular thing is supposed to be a very unsta unsteady sort of flight so we were excited about it and all that and we were waiting to board and then suddenly after about almost 3 hours of waiting we get an announcement that the flight is not going to take off because of bad con weather conditions uh you can imagine how disappointed we all were and we went back to our hotel the next morning we got up again very early and this time we said we have to go if forget about you know if a flight doesn't happen let's take a chopper and go right so we decided to take the chopper to lukla Oh my god what a phenomenal ride that was it was even better than the flight or anything because as you can imagine i was sitting on the window side of the chopper i had a perfect glass view and i could see this beautiful scenery of the mountains of small small houses in high places in the mountains is wondering how kaise rehte honge ye log itni unchi unchai par kaise khate honge kya khate honge kaise jeete honge and i was just like fascinated with this whole trip all the way up to the place in lukla anyway so finally we reached lukla and over there we met four more people these four people three three of them were going to be our porters that means they're going to be carrying our bags our sherpas and one person was going to be our assistant guide now this guy's name was krishna when he met us he said so can we get you something to drink and he was very hospitable etc and we were sitting and having some lovely delicious very refreshing ginger lemon tea just as we were about to go um, guide he came running up to us he says uh, ma'am sir sorry but uh, i will not be able to join they speak like this in a, they have a very peculiar accent uh, people from Nep nepalese people and it's very cute it sounds uh, so he said uh, sorry ma'am sir we cannot uh, i will not join because your baggage has not come i'll come with your baggage so you carry on and uh, krishna will take you 
man. So we all looked at each other. We said, you know, will this be okay? We were not sure. But then we said, all right, we just have to go with the flow. We didn't have an option because all the bookings, etc., were done in the lodges for our, for, you know, as for our arrival. And so we proceeded. We started walking and walking and walking. And I was looking, enjoying, looking at all these cute, cute Nepalese children around, the lovely looking ladies and the men smiling. They are such warm, hospitable, loving people in Nepal, I tell you. And they were such sweethearts every step of the way. But anyway, we started on the journey. And as I started walking slowly, slowly, we started to climb. Suddenly, I started feeling some sort of breathlessness. And I was so uncomfortable suddenly. So Krishna, he came up to me. He says, ma'am, no worry. Go slow. No worry. Go slow. I'm there. And he held out his hand to me. And he was a young boy. He was probably around 22, 23 years old, probably like my son. And Krishna held out his hand to me. And I literally held on to his hand. And I was slowly, slowly walking. And he was walking slowly along with me. All the other trekkers, that is Rio and the other four, another three people, they all went ahead. And um, I started feeling, you know, a little bit, you know, uncomfortable about the fact that, you know, that I'm so slow. What's happened? Why can't I do this? What's holding me back? And, you know, I was getting so paranoid and scared. I was also very cold because the weather was really bad. And my, my big jacket was in the big bag that was left behind. So I was waiting for that jacket to come. Anyway, so somehow we managed to reach the first stop that is there, which is Fakting, which is, uh, Fakting is, is uh, you know, again, it's, it's, it's slightly lower than where Lukla was. And the next day was supposed to be a bigger climb, which was going to be to Mamchi Bazaar. So Fakting was one night we had to stay in Fakting and the room was very tiny. It's a small space. I was very, very, you know, uncomfortable. The toilets were not very, you know, uh, clean. And, you know, it was bothering me, all of this, this whole discomfort, right? There was breathlessness. I was cold, a small little room, all alone by myself. So I was really, really uncomfortable with the fact that, you know, kya hoga, kya nahi hoga, you know, kind of thing. Will I be able to do this? I was feeling a sense of disappointment already. Anyway, I called my family and they said, hey, don't worry. Now that you're there, it'll work out. Don't worry, don't worry, it'll be fine. And even my friends, Rio and the other three boys, they also encouraged me and, you know, they said, you'll be fine. Don't worry. Don't worry. So the next day started and I got up with full energy. I said, no, it's got to be okay. It's, I'm going to make this happen for myself. I got up with the excitement of going and, you know, started the trek again to Namchi Bazaar. And my dear friends, some way halfway in that trek, I was so, so tired that I just literally almost fell to the floor. Meanwhile, my friends had gone ahead and um, I felt really bad about that too. I said, felt alone. The only person who was with me was my guide. He said, uh, Priya ma'am, I think that uh, you should go back. I don't think you can do this trek. And I said, no, I really want to do this. I, I don't want to go back. I want this make, to happen. I've been wanting this all my life. And you know, it was like feeling like I was getting crushed with this whole decision that I had to go back. And after all this effort, you know, it's not going to happen. And this dream that I had is not going to get fulfilled. That bucket list is going to get unchecked. And I was so scared about this whole decision making. Anyway, so I, you know, I said, listen, I'm really hungry. Let's just sit and eat somewhere. And so I sat there and I ate all by myself. I was alone sitting there because I'd reached late. Everyone else had gone ahead and they had some leftover food. So I had that and I finished eating the food and I suddenly get comes to me and he says, ma'am, I have a horse because the climb is really tough from here to get into. Would you like to take a horse for the rest of the way? And I said, for two up to Namchi, that means that it was a very, very steep. It's the toughest climb actually in the whole ever space camp. So I said, will it be okay to do that? How much will it cost? You know, all of this, all these decisions. So I said, okay, you know, get the horse because I was really so tired. My back was hurting. Everything was paining. I had blisters. I was in a mess. My morale was so down. Anyway, so he organized a horse and finally I took the horse and I did that last leg of Namchi Bazaar. It was not too much of a distance, but it was so high and so such a tall climb that I had no option but to take that horse for that stretch. Anyway, I reached there. My friends were, of course, delighted. They said, wow, you made it. And everyone started clapping for me that I finally made it up there, etc. 
But then Rio sat me down. He's Priya, I know this is tough for you. I know you'll be shattered, but I really think you should go back. And I was so, so upset. I thought in that moment, he didn't understand me. I thought in that moment, he wasn't being my friend. I felt alone. And I said, no, I, I really want to do this and I will make it happen. So he said, listen, the decision's yours, but I really don't want you to do anything that's going to put yourself in danger. Do you want to see to your family? I'm feeling responsible for you. And I was like, in that moment, I was thinking, you know, he's just being all this senti person and I don't like it and I'm going to go, I'm going to go nevertheless. And I was so sure that I wanted to go and continue going. I called my family and I started crying. And my, my sister said to me, my sister Mala, she said to me, she says, Priya, think of what you can do best in this time. You decide, you take the ownership of your decision. And if you feel, go see a doctor, check if there's something wrong with you and then take a decision, take an informed decision. Once again, I got into the gear, I went into meet the doctor, an amazing young man. When I met him, I couldn't believe firstly he's a doctor. He's such a slim, trim, short, tiny, you know, such a handsome young boy. I felt he was, you know, one of the trekkers, but he was the doctor there. And I met him and he said to me, ma'am, your vitals, everything seems fine. There's nothing wrong. Some people's bodies take a little longer to acclimatize because you have moved from sea level in Bombay all the way to such a big height. So your body takes sometimes a little bit of time. You need to just give it some time. So I would advise you that you don't go ahead with your friends. You stay by yourself. Do the trek alone. I was like, do the trek alone? What do you mean do the trek alone? How can I not be with them every evening? I know they're moving ahead of me every day, but at least in the night we talk, at least we have someone, I have someone to talk to. So Krishna spoke to him in Nepali and said that, you know, she's got a horse. Do you think, you know, it would make sense for her to take a horse? So he says, ma'am, if you want to take a horse, the horse is going to get acclimatized, but you won't. So he says, you have to do the climbing if you're going, otherwise you'll be really sick. You have to do this on your own. This is your mountain to climb, not the horse's mountain. And so true, because I did take the horse as a backup, but I walked as much as I could. And as I kept going, kept going, I realized it was a difficult climb. And if I had let the horse do all the climbing, I would not be able to go further. Dingbo J. Here we are. This gorgeous place. Look at that. Mist. That's the entry gate. Wow. Monastery. Which one? This one? And during this trip, while I was walking, while I was trekking, being tired, enjoying this beautiful scenery and this lovely rivers and waters and people and food and just the experiences, I got to know my guide Krishna. He was such a delightful young boy. He was telling me about his wife, about his son, and telling me their stories. It was so lovely to listen to all of that. What finally happened is I did summit and I did reach Everest Base Camp. The horse was with me all the way till there. Sometimes I would take it when it was difficult terrain. Sometimes I would, most of the time I was walking. But I did have the horse with me as a backup because I just wanted that security. I had fulfilled my dream and I was on my way back. I suddenly on at this, this place called Gorakship, we were parked there for the night. And next morning we were going to return. My oxygen level dropped to 42. My head started hurting and above all, I started coughing and it was becoming more and more difficult for me to breathe. I was seeing in front of me death. I had no hope of surviving that night. I spoke to the doctor 
in Kathmandu. And he said, he says, we cannot help you right now. You have to wait until tomorrow morning and stay awake as much as possible. Otherwise you'll go into a coma. So I had to stay awake that night. At that lodge where I was staying, there was no medication, there was no oxygen cylinder. There was nothing to help me, but my own presence of mind. So I literally took charge of my life and I said, what can I do to save myself tonight? Because I wanted to go back to my son and my daughter. I wanted to go back to being a mother. I wanted to go back to being a wife, to being a daughter, to being a sister, to being a friend, to all those people. And I wanted to go back and publish my book. And as I was going in and out of consciousness, I was sitting in a trans position. And the one last message my sister had said to me before my phone died, she said to me, she said, Priya, do slow breathing. And that whole night, my dears, I have watched every single breath of mine, breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out. Through the night, I have done slow breathing. I have thought of nothing else but my breath. I have kept myself warm. I've kept myself awake. Early in the morning at about six o'clock, I was in such a trance of this whole thing, not six, about five o'clock. I felt that I was falling somewhere. I don't know where, but I felt that I was going to fall into a dark pit. Maybe it was a dream or God knows what. And then I just felt somebody holding me. And I said, Krishna, and I was calling out, I believe in Lord Krishna. So I said, I was calling out to Krishna, my God, to help me. And just then, my guide, Krishna, said to me, I'm there, ma'am. Don't worry. I'm there. I'm right here with you. It was so surreal. It was such a beautiful feeling. I actually laga ki Krishna Bhagwan mere paas us waqt hain. Aur unho ne mujhe bacha liya. Subay hui, chopper aya, aur mo mujhe maha se le gaye. The chopper came and took me away. And in the hospital, I was there for about two and a half, three days. I recuperated, I came back home to my family, and here I am today. The reason I wanted to share this story, my dear children, is that in life, we all have dreams, right? And sometimes those dreams are really tough ones. But remember this, that whatever dream you have, you have to put action behind it. And whatever action you put, it's not necessary that action will give you the results that you hoped that you would get. There is possibility of disappointment. There is possibility of lots of hurdles. But I also believe that those disappointment and hurdles come because it's only to test you. It's only to check whether you are capable of actually fulfilling that dream. The prize is given to the person who really strives and keeps striving and striving and striving until the win is theirs. So this is my message to all of you that you're all so young and you have your life ahead of you. And whatever you choose to do in life, live it in a manner, choose the things that you want to do, but then get after your dream and work hard till you achieve it. And if problems come, remember that maybe this pathway to achieve your dream did not work. Come back and take another pathway to go back to your dream, right? So there's no harm in tracing your steps back. There's no harm in admitting that, yes, I was wrong. There's no harm in knowing that, yes, in every space camp, maybe I should have listened to that doctor. I wouldn't have had any of these problems. But I chose not to do that. Even at the time when I was at every space camp and I had the breathing problem, Rio and all my friends who were there with me, they said, Priya, go back now in the middle of the night. But I was so scared. I said, no, it's raining. It's dark. I'll fall. Even if I go on the horse, I don't want to die in the jungle. Here, at least I'm here in the lodge with you guys. Something happens to me, you'll take me back to my family. So I was taking decisions. We all take decisions. But when you make decisions, remember this, sometimes, you know, make a, you know, choice that may be not very right and admit it and say, all right, I was wrong. I could have done that better. So there's always this opportunity to change. And there's always this opportunity to have the chance to redo 
or this chance to actually go back and make that dream happen in a different way. Last night was my son's birthday, 9th of October. It was also the launch of my book, the book that I had written, that I had sent to my sisters and my children before leaving for Everspace Camp. Last night, I published and launched that book. So now, two of my things in my bucket list have got checked. First was completing Everspace Camp, and the second was publishing my book. I'm waiting for the next to happen. As we wait for more questions to come in, I just want to thank you for taking the time out to narrate this beautiful story. Um, you all know, I have told you that Priya was supposed to meet us before the lockdown. But we didn't get it. And um, I'm so grateful to her that she could come. I'm so grateful to her that she could come. I not only consider her as a coach or a teacher but also a very dear friend and um, i'm so glad that all of you could get to meet her today so thanks priya for sparing the time at all it's a pleasure any children you have any questions beta do you feel aapki life mein aisa kabhi kuch hua hai jo aapne decision liya aur galat chala gaya ya aap kuch aapke kya dreams hain do any of you have any dreams like this like i had my Everest Base Camp Dream. Would any of you like to say? Koi bhi, bataiye mujhe. Ma'am, I have a dream uh, of a world tour. World tour, very good, Pooja. I'm sure it'll happen. You know, they say, kehte hai, that when you dream, you do. All right? But just dreaming is not enough. So if you have a dream, you have to work towards it, darling. All right? So that means you have to put in the effort and plan and make it actually happen for yourself. Ma'am, my dream is also have to have a world tour. Okay. Superb. And you, who is this? Neha. Thank you for sharing that. And who else is this? There's some, uh, I think it is Sonia. Sonia, uh, yeah, you also want to see the whole universe. Uh, so both and even I think Prapti is saying the same thing. So yes, uh, girls, I'm so proud that you all want to see the world. That, by the way, is one of my bucket list as well, that I also want to go for a world tour. So I've been to many countries, but I have so much more to see. And someday, I hope I'll be able to take that uh, checkbox also in my bucket list. Thank Other you, Priya. Thank you, Priya, for okay, thank you, Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, it was a way. Yeah, of course, it was your life story, but the way you put it, the, I was actually, you know, when the way you're telling that you're sick, and actually, you know, I was, I was like, you know, I was putting myself see, in your yeah. no shoes, and uh, excellent narration. Your narration, narrative power is very good. I myself an English teacher, but I have to learn so many things from you. Oh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 